Well, good evening. I want to ask you to open with me to Matthew chapter 5, if you have a New Testament with you. Matthew chapter 5, that's where we'll take our study from tonight. You know, the Sermon on the Mount was not preached in a large, comfortable auditorium by a well-known motivational speaker. Rather, it was delivered on a mountainside by someone who, by his own admission, was meek and lowly in heart. Uh, that's what Jesus said of himself in Matthew chapter 11 and verse 29. And, and those who heard Jesus were not the important diplomats of his day or the wealthy businessmen of that day. They were, for the most part, the downtrodden of that society. If you look back at the end of Matthew chapter 4, it talks about those who were afflicted with various diseases in verse 24 and pains those oppressed by demons, epileptics, and paralytics. Uh, a lot of those are the folks who heard Jesus as he went into Matthew chapter 5 and, and preached the Sermon on the Mount. And so an audience like that would not have been terribly impressive from the standpoint of the world, and I'm sure that many of them saw themselves as other people did. They saw themselves as unimportant people whom the world would not miss if they didn't exist. And I wouldn't be surprised if many of these people had some questions about their lives. Things like, who, who am I? And what is, what is my purpose? What am I here for? What kind of impact is my life going to have for, you know, having existed? And it seems to me that although our circumstances may differ dramatically in many ways from those who heard Jesus preach the Sermon on the Mount, I, I still think we're confronted with the same basic questions about our lives that very likely confronted them as well. I think we sometimes struggle with our identity, and we struggle with our purpose in life. And we may even wonder at times if our lives are really going to have any kind of impact. Are they going to have a positive impact in this world or not? And I think Jesus answered these questions in the Sermon on the Mount. He answered them for the disciples who were hearing him speak on this occasion, but he also answered them for those of us who can only read his words. And so here in Matthew chapter 5, verse 14, Jesus says, You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. And so what I want us to do with our, our time this evening is just kind of go through and look at what Jesus says about these things. And, and what I want us to do first is simply notice that Jesus says something about our identity here. Who are we as disciples of Christ? Jesus said, you're the light of the world. And so he talks about our identity. And, and one thing I think that is at least implied in this, when Jesus says, you are the light of the world, is that the world in which we live is completely overwhelmed with darkness. Uh, and the sad thing about that when you, when you look around is that, that most people don't even seem to realize that. And in fact, many people seem to be convinced that really it's just the opposite of that. There's a, you know, there was a, a, a period of time in the, um, in the history of, in European history, that we sometimes refer to as the, as the Dark Ages. And the reason that phrase was used to describe it is because it was once believed that things like cultural progress and intellectual advancement, that all of that was all but halted during that period of time. And I think historians have kind of shied away from making so bold a claim about that time period now. We refer to it typically now as the Middle Ages, but many people still refer to it as the Dark Ages. And I think that, that kind of language says something about the way you know, we, we view ourselves. If there's one thing that is characteristic of our society, it's that we seem to we see ourselves as, as being enlightened. You may have heard someone even say at some point, we're not in the Dark Ages anymore. And what they mean by that is that we've learned a lot since that point in time, and, and certainly we have in many areas of life as far as technological advances are concerned. The advancement of societies is moving at an unprecedented pace. That's why you can get a computer, whether you go to the store and do that or you order it online, but before you set it up and enter in your credentials, that thing's out of date. I mean, it just happens that fast. And when you think about it, think of all the discoveries, all of the inve uh, inventions, all of the advancements that have just been made in the, like the last hundred years or so. 
And, and the impression that is sometimes given is that because of our knowledge and because of our advancement in, these, in the sciences, we, we no longer have to fall victim to the, you know, the superstitions of people in, that other people in other times have fallen uh, victim to. We don't have to fall for all of that kind of stuff anymore. There's, a, of course, a sense in which that is true. But sometimes included among those superstitions, quote unquote, that people believe we ought to no longer fall victim to is the idea that there is a standard of right and wrong, that there is conduct that is good and there's conduct that is evil and that is identifiable and, and we can know that. And that kind of thinking in, in the, the way many people see it, that, that kind of belongs to the dark ages, that belongs to the past because we're too sophisticated for that kind of thinking nowadays. We have been enlightened as you know, people sometimes will even say. But I find it interesting that many of the things that people would consider elements of enlightened living, Jesus considered elements of living in darkness. You, you see that in the scripture. Sometimes that, that kind of terminology is used. And, and I get the feeling that what many people believe to be new attitudes about certain behaviors and, and certain lifestyles really are just kind of, at best, they're new twists on old themes. You know, Solomon would say in Ecclesiastes 1 and verse 9 that there is nothing new under the sun. Uh, oh, it, it may, we, we may present it in a, a new package or something like that, but it's, it's basically the same as what has gone on before. And, and I suspect that there are times in our lives when we look at the world around us and, and we think to ourselves that things, you know, that things now are as, as bad as they've ever been. And there's probably a sense in which we're justified in thinking that. that we do live in the midst of a society that is wicked. And yet I don't think our society today is any worse than, than the world of the first century. Certainly not when you look at what was going on when Jesus came into the world. Most of the problems that we deal with in our society, uh, society today are, are problems that people have dealt with for thousands of years. They're not new problems. And what I want us to see about these things is that they're no more acceptable in the 21st century than they would have been in the first century when the biblical writers, the writers of the New Testament were, you know, writing on these same subjects. People say things like, you know, times have changed. And I guess that that's true in a sense. Times have changed. The problem is that people have not. And the fact is that God has not. And when I compare our society with, with some of the societies in ancient times, I'm surprised by, by how few uh, significant differences really there are. People want to go back to the same problems that have plagued mankind for thousands upon thousands of years. And what Jesus was saying is that his disciples have a distinct identity in this world. He said, you are the light of the world. And we get that distinct identity from, from Christ himself. As Christians, we are people who have been, as Paul would say in Colossians 1 and verse 13, we have been delivered from the domain of darkness. And now we are lights in the world. In that, we reflect the nature of the one who delivered us from the darkness to begin with in the first place. And so what I'm saying is that it is only in our connection with Jesus that, that we find this identity that he was talking about. Hundreds of years before Jesus was born, Isaiah would, uh, would say that one of the results of the Messiah coming, you know, he's writing ahead of all of this, was that he would shed light in dark places. Matthew would actually quote this passage in connection with Jesus when he was settling in the city of Capernaum in, in, uh, in Matthew chapter 4, just before Jesus, you know, gives the Sermon on the Mount. And in verse 15 of Matthew 4, he says, The land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light, and for those dwelling in the region and shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. And, of course, Jesus himself was that great light of which Isaiah, that he saw. And he looked down through the, down through the centuries and, 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 and saw what he would bring about. And, of course, several other passages make basically the same point or, or a similar point. The Apostle John in John chapter 1 and verse 9 would talk about Jesus. And he would say of him that he is the true light which gives light to everyone. Uh, you know, that he was coming into the world. And that's what he would do. And Jesus himself, on at least a couple of different occasions in the Gospel of John, in chapter 8 and verse 12, and then again in chapter 9 and verse 5, would say of himself, I am the light of the world. And what a light he was. 
I want you to think for just a moment about the condition of the world at the time of Jesus. Think of all, the, all of the sin and all of the wickedness that characterized humanity and, again, had done so for thousands of years. And I'm not saying that there were no good people who lived at that point in time because certainly there were, but there had never been anybody like Jesus. When people saw him, they were seeing a person who was described by the writer of Hebrews in Hebrews 1 and verse 3 as the, the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. That's who Jesus was. And we need to recognize that while each one of us once lived in darkness, just like the world, if we are Christians, we've been given a new identity in Christ. The Apostle Paul would say in Ephesians 5 and verse 8 that at one time you were darkness, that's who we were. But now you're light in the Lord. That's who we are now. And so we have an identity. But not only did Jesus give us an identity, he also gave us a purpose. And he stated that purpose in verse 16 when he said, let your light shine. Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. And so as Christians, we need to take this point to heart. Some people seem to believe that, that although it's good to be a Christian, I mean, we need to be one, it's not something we ought to, you know, just advertise too much. It's almost as if they don't really want anyone to know that they're Christians. They, they want to be kind of like Joseph of Arimathea, who in John chapter 19 and verse 38 is described as a disciple of Jesus, comma, but secretly. And, and I suppose there are different reasons for that. Unfortunately, some people are simply ashamed of the gospel. And they don't want to live a life of sin. I don't mean that. But they, they, don't, want to be, they don't want to be seen as, as different from everyone else around them either. And so the answer to that dilemma is that they won't live in sin, but neither will they exercise any kind of influence for good in this world. They will keep, they will keep the light under the bushel, as the little so the song that the kids sometimes sing goes. And that's, that's not going to work. Other secret disciples may have, you know, more noble reasons than that. They don't want to, you know, just do things to be seen of others so that they get glory in some way. But, but when you look at what is said here, when you look at what is said in the scriptures, I, I don't think the Lord is condemning the idea. You know, he never condemned the idea of doing good works to be seen by other people. He condemned the idea of doing good works to be seen by other people because you want them to praise you. The Lord dealt with that. The Lord wants our good works to be seen, but he wants them to be seen not so that we would be glorified, but so that, so that God would be glorified, so that we might be an example to other people. And so Jesus says, let your light shine. Do that before others. And, and when that's done with the right motive, it is not only good and right, it's something that is necessary. We need to make every effort to live in such a way that we are examples of what God wants people to be. When people look at us, they ought to be able to say, that is exactly what the scriptures teach a person needs to be. And one of the many reasons Jesus came into the world was so that he might set an, an example for other people to follow, a perfect example for them to follow. I believe the Lord did that, you know, did certain things when you read through the Gospels, fully intending for people to see what he was doing. For example, in John chapter 11 and verses 41 and 42, there's a prayer of Jesus and he is... He's going to tell them to take away the stone when Lazarus is raised from the dead. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and he says, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. And then he says, I knew that you always hear me. But I said this on account of the people standing around. That they may believe that you sent me. What's he doing? I'm saying these words so that these people will understand what's going on here. And I'm sure that we can all understand why Jesus would set himself up as an example for others to follow and, and maybe do same, some things in a sort of public way in that fashion. But our trouble comes when, you know, mere human beings set themselves up as examples. But I'll tell you what, you see that in Scripture as well. Do you remember what Paul said, Philippians chapter 3 and verse 17, as he wrote to the church in Philippi? He said, brothers, join in imitating me and, and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. That's a bold statement, isn't it? But I don't think Paul's saying, look, I'm going to elevate myself. I'm going to set myself at the top here. He just knew whom, whom it was he was following. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse, and verse 1, he says, in essence, the same thing, but he adds something to it. He says, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. He knew the person that he was following. 
He knew if people followed his example, they would be following Jesus as well. And so we can be examples for other people to follow. Again, not in some kind of arrogant way or some demanding way, but rather taking seriously the charge to reflect the character of Jesus and to let our light shine in that way. And we need not be afraid to show people what it means to be a disciple of Christ. Others need to be able to see that in us. In Philippians chapter 2, and verses 14 and following, Paul would say, There do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God, without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. So when you, when you do what you're supposed to do and you're the kind of person you're supposed to be, you're like a light in this world. You shine like that. We have a purpose for being here. Let's meet that purpose. But I also want you to see that if we'll recognize our identity and if we'll embrace the purpose that the Lord has given to us as his disciples, then our lives will make an impact. And so in Matthew 5 and verse 16, there we go. Matthew 5 and verse 16, Jesus says, not only let your light shine before others, but he gives us the, the end result so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. That's what we're aiming at in all of this. That ought to be the ultimate goal of the things that we do. And, and Jesus said that this goal will be accomplished if we're willing to let our light shine. Now, admittedly, Jesus isn't saying here, let me give you an exhaustive list of all of the possibilities of what's going to happen if you let your light shine. That's not it. The truth is there are going to be people who love darkness more than, they, than they, they love the light, and so they're going to want to get rid of anything that's going to remind them of that. And Jesus understood all too well that, that godliness sometimes brings about persecution. He was not unaware of that. In fact, just before Jesus began to talk about us being the salt of the earth and the light of the world, he would say in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 10, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That was going to be a reality as well. And, and the words of this verse imply that that we'll experience persecution of some kind as we, as we seek to be disciples of Jesus. That's going to happen also. Jesus did as he, as he lived his life. There was never a more righteous person to live upon this earth, and there was never a more persecuted person than Jesus. And those who hated him would have done just about anything they had to do in order to get rid of him, to get rid of his teaching, to get rid of his influence, even if that meant coming up with false charges and hanging him upon a cross. That's what they did. I'm sure that almost everyone here this evening understands that the, the principle involved there applies to us also. Paul would say in 2 Timothy 3 and verse 12 that, that all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Not in the same fashion. It won't always look the same. But persecution nonetheless. Persecution comes in different ways, but it will come. And yet, while recognizing the, the reality of persecution, Jesus said that those who live as lights in the world, their lives will have some kind of impact. They will make a difference in this world. And the question I have for you this evening is, do we believe that? Do we really and truly believe that? We should. I want to ask you a question. You don't have to show hands or anything like that. Ben might be a good at it. Actually, let's show hands on this. Let's do that. How many people are here this evening because of, because of disciple of Jesus let his or her light shine? Let us stand and sing. Not yet, just kidding. Almost. That's why I'm here this evening. That's why a lot of you are here this evening. And what I'm trying to say is that none of us knows what kind of impact our example is going to have on other people. Perhaps most people won't notice or care about the example that we set. But I tell you what, there's always the chance that someone will. Someone will notice. Someone will care. And we don't really know what kind of impact our lives will have. Isn't it worth it to try to reach some? You know, if you're a child of God, you don't have to be confused about who you are. You're the light of the world. And you don't have to question what you ought to be doing with your life. Let your light shine. 
And you don't have to wonder if your efforts will have some kind of impact in the world. There may be people who will see your good works and end up glorifying your Father in heaven. Isn't that a, isn't that a wonderful thought? And if you're not a Christian, I want to tell you, Jesus can give you a new identity. That's what we need. He can give you a purpose for living, one that is, that is you know, higher and nobler than the things of this world. And he can give you the kind of life that will make an impact. Make an impact on others for good. Are you interested in that? It's what Christ provides. If you've never obeyed the gospel, why not do that tonight? You believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Then, then do away with the sin that gets in the way. Repent of those things. And confess the name of Jesus. And just follow through with his command that whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. That's how you become a Christian. You just, you follow Jesus. You do what he says. If you have that need tonight, why not, why not make good on it? If you have need of, of responding to the Lord in some other fashion, maybe you've not been living like a light in this world. It's time to start doing that, to let your light shine. And if we can help you with making some things right, that's what we want to do. And so we ask you to come as we stand and as we sing. I hear the Savior.